Bruchem Aboim. The topic tonight is uh, children. Actually, the first mitzvah, the first command that God gave us in the Torah, the mitzvah of Peru or Vu, to be fruitful and multiply. And one of the questions we have to ask is very interesting uh, why do babies have babies? Most of us have our children in our 20s which is really kind of backwards. You would think it would be a little smarter to have them in the 30s and 40s. A little smarter, a little more, lived a little more, experienced more, a little more wisdom. Why in our 20s? Why do babies have babies? And it's an interesting thing. God Almighty is always trying to find a way to help us to grow, to become better. And in our 20s, even though we think that we're mature, we're physically mature. But as far as our spirituality, as far as our intellectual maturity, that really comes with more time. In our 20s, even though the cement has been poured, it hasn't hardened. And we can still change. You know, God's given us a Torah. God's given us commandments for us to be good. And we find all kinds of reasons and excuses why we can't do it or don't want to do it. And what's interesting is, is that when we have children, interesting enough, all of a sudden we look at ourselves and because of that child, we do change. We become what God wants us to be and that is giving individuals. There is no true giver, especially a mother to a child, but even a father. That's what changes our lives in many ways. Because we believe that somehow, some way, who and what we are will have an effect on that child's life, that we can make that child better or worse. And the truth of the matter is, it does have an effect. But yet there's a question that one can ask. Uh, we look in the Torah, where we find everything that we need, this instruction manual, and we see that there were two righteous individuals, Yitzchak and Rivka, Isaac and Rebekah, who had twins. One was Yaakov, Jacob, and the other one Esau. Asa. And one was righteous and one was evil. Twins. Born to the same parents. Minutes apart. And yet one was righteous and one was evil. How does that happen? If parents are so critical to this equation, how could that possibly be the case? I'm sure they brought them up identical. I'm sure they dressed them cutesy like everyone does alike. Gave them the same food, the same teachers, the same environment. Why would one be righteous and one be evil? So number one, this tells us about the fact that the world is based on free will. We are the only thing in creation that is not computerized, not on a program. We can choose, we were created but seldom will come in the image of God. We can choose between righteousness and evil. And Yaakov chose his way and Esau chose his way. But still, what we learn more than anything else is children are born with personalities. They have a certain direction that they feel when they're born. And even though we want them to go in one direction or the other, they will still choose their own direction. We really do not direct their lives. We can help them. In many cases, it makes a big difference. And even in the case of Asaph, it did make a difference. But the truth of the matter is that the reason why we have children is for us to grow, not for them. God gives us the children that he gives us as a gift. Before that cement hardens, the babies who have babies can grow because they have children. Because those children force them to look at themselves and to grow up, to become more giving human beings, to look at someone else before yourself. Because the true joy in life comes from being a giver, not a taker. Even though one would think the opposite. The yikuli truma, take from me truma. When a person gives to, gives to God, that he's really taking for himself a true gift, the gift of the joy of giving and also the good deed, that mitzvah that goes on to the next world, he banks it. And again, so God, the first mitzvah that God gives us is to have children in the hope that we will become better human beings. He fools us, so to speak, into becoming better by virtue of bringing up that child. But still, why do we, it's interesting, the Torah commands us to love, not love, but to honor and respect our parents. It does not command us to love our children. 
Why? And the answer is going back to creation, Adam, first man, did not have parents. Therefore, having to loving parents or honoring, respecting parents is not necessarily a natural thing. That's why it's one of the Ten Commandments. On the other hand, children, Adam and Eve did have children. So it is built within the DNA of all creation to love their children. Even Noah, who was criticized for not saving his generation, is not complimented for saving his family, which he did, because even animals do that. He needed to rise above that of an animal, which he did not, and that was a criticism. So when we, li when we love our children, we love them the truth of the matter before they're born, just anticipating them. And when they're born, what do they do? They sleep, they poop, they keep us up all night, they drive us nuts. And then we spend the rest of our lives making money and trying to do things to give them a better life. And it's interesting. The Gemara says, two people you're not jealous of is a student and a child. We actually want our children to do better than us. Remember somebody who wanted to give me a little shtick once, told me how my son's voice was better than mine. And I laughed and I thanked him. And I thanked him. Because there's no greater joy than a parent has to think that his child is better than he is, in all ways. That's what we strive for. So from there we learn this nullification, this bittel, and we use that to, to serve God. The nullification that connects to God, everything that connects to God. Now, but if that's the case, if children have their own personalities, so why do we have to bother? And the answer is, even though they may have their own personalities, we do have some influence on them. Even if they're born and have a predilection towards being evil. Because even the evil Asaph, when we talk about honoring parents, what is the Gemara, what does the Talmud use as an example? Asaph. Asaph was the one who honored his father Yitzhak more than anyone else. And from him, from that evil person, we learn. And it's also interesting that from Asaph we see that what we do with children is we learn to go against our nature. The nature of his father Yitzhak was to be a tough individual. What he should have done with an Asaph is kicked him out of his house. But instead he kept Asaph close, so close that he allowed his wives to bring up incense to idols, which blinded him. He still kept Asaph close, even though it was a difficulty for himself, even physically, to cause him pain and sickness. And what was the gain of that? Why? And the answer is again, Asa became someone who we learn how to honor a parent from. Not only that, if not for that, when Asa, when Yaakov leaves after he takes the blessing and he goes to Lovin's house, Asa sends Eliphaz, his son, to kill Yaakov. And Eliphaz does overtake Yaakov. And he says, I have to kill you, my father has sent me. But Yaakov pleads for his life. And because Eliphaz was brought up on the, on the knee of his grandfather Yitzchak, he finds a way, Yaakov tells him, a poor man is considered as if he's dead, take all my possessions. And this way, your father can't argue with the fact that you did not kill me. Because he said, how, my father, I can, how can I go against my father? So we see that this, there's still always a thread of goodness. You know, man is called an Eitzasad, a tree of the field. And sometimes we see a generation that is not the way the parents bring them up. They don't follow in the ways of God. They're not necessarily good people in any way. But that doesn't mean that their children will not be that way, or grandchildren from them. Sometimes you see a tree that looks like it's dead, but at the top of the tree you see there's live leaves growing. You never know. And this becomes the key. That any effort that's put into bringing up children is never wasted. Somewhere down the road it will bear fruit. So even though we do not dictate our children's personalities, when you see a little kid and he complains all the time, he'll be an adult that complains all the time. If he's aggressive, he'll be aggressive as an adult. These are the things they work on or cultivate, depending upon what it is. Little children are little adults. They're people. And God brings everyone into this world with a personality that they have to deal with. So what are we as parents? And it's interesting, we see, we are really what we call miraglim, spies. We see that in the Torah, when Moshe Rabbeinu, when Moses sends the 12 spies into the land of Israel, that they fail bitterly. And because of that, the Jews 
are condemned to wander in the desert for the remaining 38 years. When Yoshua sends spies at the end of their journey, he sends two. They're very successful because the first spies were very selfish. They were all concerned about themselves. All of them were great men. When Yoshua sends only two, they didn't represent all 12 tribes. They represented the nation as one. And they were successful. And God Almighty also does the same thing. He sends two spies into this world before children are born, a mother and a father, that spy out the world. And it becomes their job to bring a report to this child, to help the child to know what they're looking for. To be those, those two people that give advice and information as to what to look forward to. The sad part is children don't listen all the time. But, you know, it's interesting. A smart person learns from his mistakes. A brilliant person from someone else's. If you listen to your parents, especially if they're good parents, they will help you to live your life because their experience becomes a benefit to you. But why do we love our children? And the answer really is, is that we love children because we are a reflection of God. And a whole relationship that we have with our children is the same relationship that God wants to have with us. As much as we want our children to love us, as much as we want to be a part of our children's lives, that's exactly what God wants. That's what we are, a reflection of God Almighty. And when God puts us into this world, what he wants to do is, so to speak, shep us. He wants to have enjoyment from who and what we are. It's interesting. What if a person has two sons? One that's born as a superstar and the other one that's born more normal. Which one defines that person? Now, it's nice to have a son that's a superstar, but he talks about how great he is. But the truth of the matter is, in reality, you know, no matter who his parent would have been, he still would have been a superstar. He was born gifted. But when you have a child that hustles and pushes, he defines who you are. And that becomes the key. There's an interesting law in Torah that talks about sending away the mother bird. And when you send away the mother bird, you get long life, a great reward for it. You can't take the, the, the chicks or the eggs from the nest without sending her away because she's trying to protect her nest. Can't take the mother and the eggs. But what's interesting is there is no law of sending away the mother deer if you want to take a fawn. You can take the mother and the young. Why? Why shouldn't that be the same thing? A matter of cruelty, a matter of letting a species live. Why this special law about a mother bird sending her away when she, what, you want to take the eggs out of the nest? And the answer is because the, the eggs do not look like the mother. And still she loves them and protects them with her life. And so too with us. That many times we have children that are born to us that do not reflect us, do not give us any joy, that are challenged, that are handicapped. And they are children that are not going to bring us that type of nakas as a normal child. But yet, our job is still to love them, and even to love them more, to protect them, to do all that we need, and through them, through protecting them, them with the blessing, again, the two mitzvahs, that, the two good deeds, that we know the blessing is long life, is honoring parents, and at the same time sending away the mother bird. When a parent does his or her job properly, you get, you're granted long life. Long life also means a good life. And the way that you, what you give, you get. So all of this idea of children. Again, if you teach children, whatever you teach your children, you have what to teach, talk to them about. There's no generation gap. When you teach them Torah, Torah is timeless. The five-year-old boy and the 85-year-old scholar learn the same book. They have what to talk about. This big generation gap that we always talk about are not, is, not, is not around anymore. So again, God fools us into becoming better people by virtue of giving us children. A judge cannot adjudicate in Jewish law unless he has children. He has to know mercy. He has to know kindness. He has to know suffering. You know, it's interesting. When I we were younger, my wife and I looked at other people and wondered, how could they let their kids do it? You don't let your kids do anything. Truth of the matter is, they have a mind of their own. What we need to do is to help them as best we can and stay out of their way and let them go as they need to. They are a gift from God, and we need to know that. May God bless you all and all your children and all that you do. God bless and thank you for coming.